forces transit to the Tiber system, Vandal forces have established a permanent occupation. So this is a system that's been embroiled in a lot of Vandal fighting for centuries now. It is very dangerous and very exciting. And let's travel there now and take a look. So we're going to head over in our fantastic Starma to Tiber. Um, I did a search for it, but instead of that, let's, uh, let's forget that. And let's go of roots and actually travel there. So let's go from the Earth, planet and soul, to Tiber. And we are going to go in a small ship today. Let's calculate that route. Uh, five stops. Sounds good to me. We'll head through Pro Shop. So we'll go on through. Heading out from Earth. We went out to Croshaw. We go to Null. Head on over to Caliban. And, and, and then from there, we go to Orion. And Orion, we're going to make one last jump through to Tiber. Whoa! I love that. Welcome to Tiber. Now, Tiber at its core has a K3 type main sequence star. It is often called an orange dwarf or a K dwarf. It is a hydrogen burning star and it's considered very stable. Uh, they exist on the main sequence for a very long time. Tiber is 0.85 AU wide. And that distance right there, that's calculated from the, when we say how big of a system is. That's the farthest planet's epihelion, which is its farthest point in the star. So in this case, we have a system that's 0.85 AU, which isn't very big. That's actually smaller than the Earth's distance from the sun. And we have in our green band from 0.47 to 0.68 existing right there. And we have two planets and an asteroid belt. Let's go over to Tiber 1, kind of just getting an overview of the system right now. So Tiber 1 is located at 0.56 AU, and it is inside the green band. It is a small, dense, rocky planet, and it has a greenhouse CO2 atmosphere. And so that means it traps a lot of this heat that it's getting from being so close to the sun, and it's really unbearably hot inside there, which makes living conditions very unpleasant. Even though the atmosphere is technically breathable, you couldn't spend much time on the surface. Um, and there is a fairly regular weather pattern where you get a slightly lessening of this effect every couple years, so uh, conditions become a little bit more habitable. And you'll have a, back in the early days, you would have companies and industries using this weather pattern to time when they go down to the planet's surface. And later on, in modern times, you'll have scavengers and salvagers using this weather pattern to time their expeditions. And likewise, even the Vandal seem to coordinate the access to their planet around these regular storm systems. So right next to Tiber 1 is the Tiber asteroid belt, known as Tiber Belt Alpha. It is a very dense belt. And it still has a lot of valuable resources left for mining um, because of the devastating war that interrupted industry there. Uh, it is very dangerous to cross, not only because of how dense it is, but because it was heavily mined by UE forces, mined in terms of dropping explodey things into the belt, not mined as in digging up rocky bits. Um, and then right outside of there, we have Tiber II, also known as the Tomb. And we'll get into a little bit more why it's called the tomb in just a moment. Uh, but this is a terrestrial desert planet. And it is located at 0.81 AU. It's just outside the green band. And from there, that's kind of the system overall. So we can dive now into a little bit of the history of the system. It was first discovered in 2474 as part of Project Far Star. Now, for those of you who don't know, Project Far Star was this big initiative that was to push the boundaries of humanity as far as we can go. So there is this major initiative to discover a whole bunch of new systems and jump points, and a lot was discovered during the, that time the project ran. And this was part of it. Um, and that was run by the United Nations of the Earth, UNE. Um, 
So because neither of the planets were that habitable and they weren't really good terraforming candidates, the system wasn't really used for settlement. It was mostly used for industrial purposes. There was mining and industry that went on, and it was kind of slow to grow. Uh, because of Project Farsa, there was a bunch of other systems discovered around the same time, so not that much attention was paid to Tiber. Um, however, later on, you would have an exciting discovery of the Orion system. And because of this jump here, uh, Tiber all of a sudden became a lot more exciting um, because there was a lot of people going to Orion to take advantage of Armitage, which was an awesome new planet that was discovered there. And everyone wanted a hot piece of the hot Orion action. And so Tiber it got like a major rest stop, settled outside of the jump point. And all these businesses were trying to take advantage of those travelers moving through the system, get a few credits off them while they could. Uh, and that was the front of it. Like you would have a you know mining outpost, refineries. You'd have a couple housing exchanges, um, which is kind of like Grimhex. Grimhex is a housing exchange that's fallen onto hard times. But housing exchanges are kind of these uh, apartment buildings, for lack of a term, better term, in space where workers would find temporary housing um, while they were working mining asteroid belts or what have you. Um, so in 2650, we had the jump to Orion taking off. But that wasn't meant to last very long, because all of a sudden, in 2681, the Vandal struck the system and dealt a devastating blow to Amitage. So many deaths on the planet, massive destruction, and it came out of nowhere, very surprised by the Vandal. And over the next few years, Tiber would transition from being this industrial system to being this stopping point on the way to Orion to now it's becoming a military staging system. Huge amounts of naval forces were moving into the system in order to be better prepared to fight in Orion. And so a lot of the civilian stations were bought up by the government and transitioned into military platforms. Uh, and then this went on for a couple decades until the final devastating blow, which happened in 2712, which is known as the Battle of Orion, when all of a sudden, for the first time in human history, a kingship showed up in Orion and completely wiped the floor with us. The system was abandoned. And all the human survivors came rushing out of the system in a mass evacuation um, that like, really left the lasting effect of the people who were stationed in Tiber. Like, there's stories that be told about just seeing all these like, heavily damaged ships and injured people coming through the jump point, barely escaping the Vandal attack. So with that mass exodus and Orion now officially in Vandal hands, Tiber became the new front of this burgeoning fight against the Vandal. Um, and everyone was expecting that the Vandal would just push on after taking Orion and come into Tiber and start fighting us there. And so everyone was really nervous, ready for a kingship to come on through. But nothing happened. The Vandal stopped their forward momentum and just hung out in Orion. And so for a long time, uh, Tiber was quiet until 2726, when all of a sudden a Vandal blade showed up out of nowhere, far away from the jump point, and it came out of a new system, which we didn't know what it was at the time, but would later be identified as VS1 or Vector. Um, a lot of the Vandal systems that uh, have that V name designation, so they get VS number and then a V name. So in this case, we have VS1, which is known as Vector. Um, so once that contact was made, all of a sudden clans started attacking Tiber. And um, there was a long, sustained military motion, movement. So in 2732 was the start of what's officially known as the Siege of Tiber, which was just this long, stretched out entrenchment. Now, Tiber itself wasn't that important, but the UE really wanted to hold on to it. They had already lost Orion. They wanted to put the foot down and really defend the empire. So there was no way they were going to give up Tiber. So it became this long, protracted battle. Uh, lasted four long years. 
and the military threw everything they had against the Vandal, nearly losing the system several times. Um, and it was because of this really long, bloody conflict that Tiber got its nickname, the Grinder, because it just ate up all the ships and just spat them out. Uh, a whole generation of men and women could be seen around the Empire just bearing heavy scars of the fighting they endured in Tiber. Um, and actually, one of the cybernetic uh, breakthroughs that happened that allowed for improved synaptic responses came because there was such a high demand all of a sudden for cybernetic replacements after this conflict. Uh, and the process was known as Tibering, uh, which bears the name of the system. Um, so it was finally in 2736 where everyone's worst fears came true and the second kingship came through to the system. And at that point, there was no hope. And once again, the UE had to fall back. Uh, one famed squadron, Squadron 214, known as uh, the Black Crows, became famous for their work. They were a bomber squadron flying most gladiators, but they switched rapidly when it was clear that the system was lost to doing search and rescue operations and really trying to move people out of the system. Um, and so, the defeat in Tiber was so swift and sudden that the military just wasn't ready. And this time, they were kind of hoping that it would happen like last time, where the Vandal took over a system and then kind of stopped, but that wasn't the case. Once they took over Tiber, they just went rolling on through and moved straight into Virgil and would take over very quickly. And Virgil was lost within the year as well. Uh, so that was kind of the end of humanity's uh, kind of presence in the Tiber system. You'll see now on your screen that there isn't uh, that cool glitchy effect, but if you look at it in the actual star map, you'll see that it's UE classified because there isn't official updated information from the system because it's so hard to get into. Um, most people who go visit it now are either military operations that still go in to keep tabs on what the Vandal are doing in the system, or it's either outlaws or scavengers looking to kind of make money from the wealth of resources as well as all the salvage that's just floating around in the system. With so many battles over the year taking place here, there's a wealth of kind of military gear and vandal ships floating around, but it comes at a very high price. And that high price is represented very well on Tiber II. Uh, Tiber II is a red desert world and it is orbit is just covered with a huge amount of debris of spaceships. Like you'd almost think it was a, well, an asteroid ring um, like you'd have around, not an asteroid ring, but a ring like you'd have around Saturn, but it's just made up of ship debris. Um, and the planet's surface is scarred heavily by the conflict that happened there. In addition, you also have on the surface massive vandal harvesters that are chewing through all the ships and resources and minerals and ores and any bodies they find and grinding them up for the Vandal's own purposes, um, as well as temporary Vandal war camps that set up residents here. Now, it isn't like there's one clan that owns Tiber. There is actually battles between Vandal clans as they vie with each other to take control of the resources that are to be had here. So in addition to the Vandal themselves to being a threat, there is also a threat of being caught in the crossfire from one of these battles between Vandal clans. But on the bright side, it means that the Vandal haven't built up too heavy of a front in the system because of how much they war with each other. So it's always in flux. Um, and so you, you hear stories of people about trying to do the runs and coming out on the other side or not coming back at all. If you see like an outlaw group in the verse flying a lot of outdated military ships, there's a good chance that they salvage them from Tiber at the great personal risk, which is like a badge of pride amongst various outlaw groups. Uh, a lot of you might already have a piece of Tiber in your hangar because part of the Puglisi collection is the AV-8 uh, battle armor replica, which is inside that nice glass display case is the Resilient Series Battle Armor made by Errol Future Tech. And it was used by the Marine Shock Troopers in the Siege of Tiber, and it protected it from ballistic and energy weapons.
So that's really cool. So take another look at that when you have a chance in your hangar. So that's about it for the Tiber system. It was but all this is important to know for me if I should understand what Star Citizen is, what the universe around the Star Citizen, what the history and what uh, yes, what stories, storylines and stuff. So I need watch this, but uh, I have soon a record six hours. But uh, I have nothing to do with just watch uh, Netflix. Yes, but I cannot remember all this. There's 54 uh, star systems and they talk about 20 hours. I cannot remember all this. There's many hundred planets and you cannot remember everything. I have to see that two times. But uh, I will watch my own uh, videos. I will do that later. In the future, soon. The scene of much death and destruction, and its fate is still unknown. Maybe one day now that Admiral Bishop is once again moving along the front, we can see humanity taking a bath, but we'll have to wait and find out what happens there. So thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this Lore Maker's Guide to the Galaxy. Thank you for all your support and back in the game, and I hope to see you around. Thanks again. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in the Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, this is please Chris follow us on our YouTube channels. See you soon. But you could sound uh, English. But I, may, I think he's American. But I think he's... I don't know. I have to check that. He could be English, but living in uh, Los Angeles. Garan system. I have 40 minutes left. That's 22 minutes. But I have to uh, check my upload to YouTube. I cannot just uh, lay here half an hour. I don't know why it's so blurry. You can see that. I don't know why display. Yes, let's search next one. Change to my other glass. I don't think it's my glasses, but this looks very really blurry. Yes, that's Garon. But uh, short commercial break. Need to look uh, upload to my uh, YouTube channel, Monko TV. I cannot just. Uh, not uploading half an hour, that's too long time. Constellation Aquilia But uh, let's look at the next star system The Garon I have to change to my uh, normal glasses We have the Garon, the 
garland star of course nobody lives on a star that's not possible we have a planet very very close i think that's too hot lava planets at a restaurant planet located so close to the system star the entire surface is covered in lava that's probably not a good place but we could try to go there in the future why not and this is the green zone, the Garand, Garand 2 we have a space station this is a terrestrial rocky habitat, yes, Garand 2 while the re revolution removed the messias before the terraforming had complete the indigenous species were long dead. The new imperator, Erin Toy, Toy, shot down the terraformers and declared the planet a natural habitat preserve. OEE scientists have since worked to help the planet revert back to its original form. Yes, we have a space station. No, that's too close, I cannot click. There's UB Hella Space Station. A station placed near Garon True, OB Heller, houses the scientific teams that are working to restore the planet, but the station also acts as an ecotourist site to educate and inform people about terraforming. The Fair Change X Humanities Responsibility and the Super Yes. And we have the Garon number three. There's an ice planet. No, but it lives there. A super earth that formed near the frost line, so it's too cold for life. There are multiple mining operations currently operating. Yes, there's a mining planet. And we have another one far away. Garon 4 Yes, terrestrial rocky A lifeless planet on the fringe Could be something interesting there Yes, we have the Yes, the Garon 2 is the only one Somebody is living. So let's look what they are saying about that. The Garon. Welcome to another edition of the Lore Maker's Guide to the Galaxy, where we spotlight one of the many, 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 many star systems in the Star Citizen universe and talk about the system itself, uh, a bit about its history, and uh, some insight into you know, some of the, the choices that we made when kind of coming up with it and conceiving it. Uh, I'm Dave Haddock. I'm the lead writer over here at Cloud Imperium Games, and I will be your guide on today's fantastical adventure of sadness. Uh, so today, 
we are going to be talking about a system uh, that's pretty heavily steeped in the 